Uh, I'd like everyone to take a moment right now and to, uh, to answer this question. Why do some prayers get answered and others don't? Uh, d- does it seem like God is sometimes inconsistent in the way he answers prayers? I'm sure that all of you at some point uh, sitting in this room have prayed a prayer uh, that God has not answered and, and you're left kind of wondering why. Uh, I've experienced this quite a bit in my own life. Uh, there's times where I'm praying to God and it's like I'm aligned with heaven and I'm just like hearing, I'm hearing his voice and I'm, I'm praying prayers and he's answering them. Uh, other times it's like, God, what happened? Like I wasn't even close. Like something... Uh, is different. And it's, sometimes it's hard to understand God. And I start asking questions like, maybe I'm not doing this right. Like, uh, you guys have seen chat before, maybe. Uh, it's like a framework for praying. You can put that slide. Okay, confess, honor, ask, thanks. It's like, well, I, I didn't pray chat. I prayed uh, hatch. Anyone ever prayed hatch? Honor, ask, thanks, confess. Get the order out, uh, out of whack. And God's like, sorry, man. Not going to cut it. Not going to work. Uh, maybe you guys have used a prayer wheel before, another resource that we've used at this church several times. Uh, you pray through all these different kind of areas of prayer in five-minute increments. And, and for me, I try to practice this once a week, and I like always run out of time, and I never get to listen. And God's like, dude, you never listen. I'm not going to answer your prayers. Prayer is hard to understand. And then what we do as people is we try to understand God because there's some emotions around prayer that, that are, are sometimes unfamiliar and so what we do is we put a framework around prayer. Uh, maybe you guys have seen this one before. This is uh, straight from Pinterest. I was browsing Pinterest last night. I came across. All right, God's three answers to your prayers. Number one, yes, we all love that one. That's my favorite. Uh, number two, not yet. Uh, less uh, of like that one with God, but I'll, I'll take it. And then three is I have something better. Hmm. And I see this and I'm like, yeah, there's some truth to that. And I'm not here to patronize that. I think there is some truth, but sometimes it feels like the answer is no. You ever prayed a prayer that just didn't get answered? Why? What's your framework? What's the framework that you, uh, you kind of put prayer uh, within the confines of? Uh, for some of you, maybe it's like, I don't doubt God's power, I just doubt his closeness. I doubt his intimacy to us. Like, he's kind of a, a distant God. And yeah, there's like these promises and stuff around prayer, but I, I just, I don't know if, I, if I'm in tune with him. For some of you, maybe it's not God, it's you. Like, I'm not fasting enough, and that's why my prayers aren't getting answered, or... I'm not praying uh, with enough faith. Uh, Or I'm just praying the wrong way and I'm saying, dear God, instead of our Father. And God's like, I made it so clear in the Gospels. It's our Father. What is this dear God stuff? Are you writing me an email? Like, come on, man, figure it out. We all put uh, different frameworks around prayer. And the point that I want to make this morning is, is that it would appear we have a dilemma. And I think that this is a dilemma that all of us as followers of Jesus will at some point find ourselves wrestling with inevitably when it comes to our prayer lives, especially as we actually start uh, positioning ourselves in a posture of prayer. And here it is. It's some prayers go unanswered, and yet Jesus makes this promise to us. Uh, he says this in John 15, 7 through 8. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, and here it is, here's the promise, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. What did Jesus mean by this? It it would seem that we have two responses. I think the first response is is that we make God out to be a liar. Like God, maybe there's some vague, I don't know, theological interpretation of that, and it doesn't actually mean that when you're like, you know, thinking about the cultural, you know, scenario at the time, like whatever the thing is that we put on there, okay? I I think the second is, is that it's not something wrong with God. Maybe it's something wrong with us, our interpretation, our understanding. Something is missing. Uh, Today, I want to talk to you about what is missing, and I want to share with you the secret to praying powerful prayers. I just got back from a trip to the East Coast. Uh, it was kind of like a prayer and teaching retreat uh, in Vermont, uh, Woodstock, Vermont, which like this is peak season for the fall. It was absolutely beautiful. I got to spend some time in New York City as well as Boston. And uh, while I was there, I-, I met two new friends and you can put that picture up. So this is, uh, this is Yeshua, which is like the coolest name in the world. I think it means Jesus. Uh, and he, he honestly, not, like, he's not too far off. Uh, and then this is Matt over here on the left. And uh, what these two guys do is they are culinary experts. They travel around the world with a, a small business that they have called Kiave, and they serve like the nicest plated dinners, finest wines to like cultural elites. I mean, just to put this into perspective, the average price tag, if you were to have these guys come to your house and serve you dinner and wine, $80,000. You're like, whoa. 
I've never dropped that on a dinner before, I can assure you. <laughs> and, and these guys, what's interesting about them is not only are they culinary experts, but they're uh, sommeliers, they're advanced level sommeliers. And we're in a series called Fine Wine Talking About Wine. And I don't know a lot about wine, and so it was a gift to be around these guys to learn about wine. And just like listening to the way that they describe wine is the most unbelievable. Like, have you ever heard a sommelier describe wine? It's like a work of art. They're like, oh, we have a 2017 Vacaras from the southern region of France, and uh, it grew in the you know, Sonoma area, this climate, and it's like astringent and electric with chalky notes of pine and arugula and apricot. Uh, it's bold and yet bright, uh, astringent and yet buttery. And you're like, dude, I don't even know what you're saying, but it's just beautiful and I want to drink it now. And then, you know, I take a big gulp and I switch around my mouth. I'm like, oh, that's good. <laughs> I'm tasting some, uh, some, some grapey notes with uh, a, a purpley after finish. Are you, are, you, are you getting that as well? Yeah, you are. Okay. Okay. Got it. It's amazing. And so, so I started talking to these guys about, wait, what does it take to actually become a sommelier? And they start talking through it. And there's, there's four primary stages. So, so the first stage is what's called introductory. And uh, this, is a, this is a party trick. This is impressing your friends at a party. You might work at a restaurant. Um, you feel confident in your knowledge of wine. The second stage is what is called certified, I think associate's degree, two, two years of, of practice. At this point, you're running reference. Oh, yeah, we got a chart up there. We got a chart. I, I love a good chart. I've never seen a chart that I didn't like. Um, Certified, uh, so, so this is like you're running restaurants, you're organizing tastings, uh, teaching at an inter introductory level. The third stage of becoming a sommelier, this is where things start to get real. It's called the advanced stage. Uh, this is a full-time job, four years of studying, uh, roughly, and this is coming from these guys, 15 to 20 hours per week between studying and tasting, another 20 hours per week running beverage programs. So what that is, is 8,900 hours over four years. Like this is serious stuff becoming an expert in wine. And then the final stage is what's called mastery level. And it's like otherworldly. There's 269 masters on planet earth. Uh, and, and the way that I understand master sommeliers is that you basically have to sell your soul to wine. Uh, these guys are devout followers of Jesus. They're incredible guys. Uh, they're family men. And so they're like, we're just going to stay at the advanced level. We're not going to uh, pursue the mastery level. Um, and, and, and what's amazing about these guys is like, as they're talking about wine and I'm learning from them, uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's such a gift. And I say to him, I'm like, okay, Matt Yeshua, like, just shoot me straight. Shoot me straight for a moment. Is this just like a gift that you're born with? Like, is it just, no one can do this, but you guys, like you just were born with a God-given ability to, uh, to, to taste wine. And he goes, bro, it's a discipline. It's a discipline. Most of the sommeliers probably want you to think that it's just a very, very rare gift. He goes, it's a discipline. And the same is true for prayer. The same is true for prayer. Um, there are many spiritual gifts uh, that we talk about in our community all the time. Uh, spiritual gifts of prophecy and evangelism and, and uh, administration. Uh, prayer is not one of them. The only people that I've ever met who are bad at prayer are those who don't pray. Prayer is not a, a spiritual gift. And in the same way that there are stages to growing as a wine expert, a sommelier, there are stages to prayer. And so today I wanna share with you uh, the three stages to, to, to prayer. Um, and before I share them with you, I just, I want to say this. I don't have a biblical theology of these three stages. I can't like point to you in scripture uh, where, where they exist. But I think that what you'll discover as we go through them is that there's quite some truth to them. Uh, and also, I don't want to present them, th though they are sequential, as like stage one is for babies and stage three is for black belts. Uh, I think that at some point, like we're, we're going to kind of find ourselves in all of them. Uh, but there is a progression as we mature uh, as followers of Jesus. So let's get into it. Uh, the first stage of prayer is what's called prayers of request, uh, which this is honestly just us asking God to do our will. A lot of us can relate to prayers of request. Uh, sometimes we ask God to act in our lives and he just does because he is a kind, good-natured uh, father. This is, this is a, a father, if you are real, I ask in the name of Jesus right now for a promotion. In the name of Jesus, give me a promotion. And then your boss calls you in like, like a day later and he's like, hey man, you got a minute? Oh, I've been expecting this. How much is it? <laughs> right? But sometimes he doesn't answer the prayers, regardless of where you're at in your faith journey. Sometimes it's like, Lord, if you are real, make her like me. Like, please, Jesus, make her like me. And then you see her like talking to another guy at church the next weekend and you're like, God, why have you forsaken me? <laughs> and God's like, look, man, it's not you, it's her. She doesn't like you. I love you. She doesn't like you. 
But sometimes we ask for God's will, and I think especially, you know, it's representative of the early stages of a Christian's walk. Like, we ask God for things, and he just, uh, uh, those of you who are parents of young kids, you know, your your three-year-old comes to you and says, like, mom, dad, can I have a sucker? And sometimes you just give them a sucker. You know in your heart of hearts that it's probably not good for for their their physical body to give them a sucker, but also you recognize as a parent that it's also just as important and sometimes more important to establish your nature as a loving parent to your child. But what you also realize is, is that it's not healthy to keep them there for the rest of their lives. And so at some point, you want to progress them and to advance them. Uh, parents of teenagers, God bless your souls. Uh, I hit the height of my disobedience as a human being at the age of 13. Like, I have so much grace for parents of teenagers. It's like you're in this weird place where you're smart enough to be witty, uh, but also like so immature that you're completely unaware of your surroundings and emotions. I'll never forget this. Uh, my, my parents, uh, when I was 13 years old, a friend of mine's having a Super Bowl party. I wanted to go. And uh, the Super Bowl party was supposed to go to like, a, like 11 o'clock p.m. or something. And my parents say, look, man, nothing good happens after 10 p.m. You're not going. And I was upset and I was frustrated. And I was like, why can't I go? Like, I want to go. And so what I did was I did what most 13-year-olds do is I called a family meeting. And I sat my parents down and I said, mom, dad, good to see you guys, hope all is well. Uh, wanted to talk to you about something, uh, about this kind of issue that we have here. And, uh, and I looked them both in the eyes and, and I said this to them. I said, mom and dad, um, if you couldn't handle the responsibility of having children, you shouldn't have chose to have them. <laughs> and I became a pastor. So, so really the, the message there is that there's hope for your children. <laughs> But the point that I want to make is, is that my parents, uh, looking back in hindsight, were actually loving me really well. Uh, they, they were loving me by withholding some things uh, from me. Uh, a child uh, looks to their parents and thinks, one of the ways that you love me is you let me do whatever I want. An adult looks to their parents or looks to, to their mentors and they say, one of the ways that I know you love me is you don't let me do whatever I want. It's a sign of maturity. Uh, there's a, a Richard Foster quote. Uh, this guy wrote a book on prayer that's a wonderful book. And um, I'm taking a risk as a communicator because this is a really long quote and you're not supposed to do this. And I probably wouldn't share it with most audiences, but you guys, you guys can handle this, all right? So, So stick with me on this quote, okay? So he says this on prayer. He says, as we are learning to pray, we discover an interesting progression. In the beginning, our will is to, is in struggle with God's will. We beg, we pout, we demand. We expect God to perform like a magician or shower us with blessings like Father, Christmas. We major in instant solutions and manipulative prayers. As difficult as this time of struggle is, we must never despise it or try to avoid it. It is an essential part of our growing and deepening in things spiritual. To be sure, it is an inferior stage, but only in the sense that a child is at an inferior stage to that of an adult. The adult can reason better and carry heavier loads because both brain and brawn are more fully developed, but the child is doing exactly what we would expect at that age. What's he teaching us? This is part of kingdom life. You have needs. God responds to those needs. He establishes his nature as a loving parent. And that leads us into our second stage of prayer. This is, uh, this is the next stage. Uh, this is called prayers of relationship. And this is God weaning us off of simply asking for our will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And he's, he's helping us answer the central question, do you love me for what I do? Or do you love me for who I am? This is the, the time when we come to God in prayer and we stop simply asking for things, for, for God to do things for us. And we start God asking God, who are you? Reveal your nature to me. Show me your character. Show me your heart. Uh, this is the point where we discover who God is in our lives. And, and, and make no mistake about it, this is a, a powerful posture of prayer. This is where prayer, I think, begins to start regenerating us and changing us from the inside out. Uh, David, the, like the, the godfather of prayers, he was also like a drama queen, but he was an amazing prayer warrior. Listen to how he prays in Psalm 27 4. He says this One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. If I asked you to describe God in one word, how many of you would say beauty? Would that be the first thing that comes to mind? Like if I asked you, like, hey man, like, what are you doing with your life? And you're like, well, I was considering being an accountant or an engineer, but the one thing I really want to do is gaze on the beauty of the Lord in his temple for the rest of my days. Beauty? 
temple? Like, like, where does that language come from? There was something that I think was changing in David's heart. And I think that leads us uh, into the third stage because uh, it's not just about power and answers. It's, it's about who God is to us. And this third stage of prayer um, is not a stage that God brings you into. I think it's one that he invites you into. And I'm afraid that, that most uh, people in the Christian walk never discover it because it's very difficult. It's very difficult. Uh, this is called prayers of relinquishment. And this is the stage where prayer starts to change us. Uh, this is the stage of prayer where we are um, changed into the types of people who are willing to do whatever it is that God is asking us to do uh, that we wouldn't be willing to do in stage one types uh, of prayer. These are prayers of not God, please do what I want, but God, I don't want to do it. But I trust that your will is perfect and I trust that your plan is perfect. And so let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, this is when I believe prayers start to get dangerous because they start to transform us and the people around us. And I just, I want to, I want to camp on this for a moment. These prayers are so difficult and so hard to pray. Uh, just this week, I was, I was talking to, to God about something that I've just desired for so long. And I'm like, Lord, like, please, would you give this to me? Please. Like I have sought your face for so long, but Lord, if it's not your will, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that because your will is better and I trust you, and it hurts. Like, I'm not sugarcoating this. Like, it's a hard prayer to pray, but as I pray that more and more, I notice myself changing. I notice my desires starting to change. And I, I don't want you to think that this just affects you. I think that it also affects your circumstances in the world around us. Listen, we, we are a, a highly outward focused church. Like we have a mission to make disciples who make disciples for generations to come. It is our heartbeat. It is what I love about this church. The evangelism of the city of Denver could happen in a year if the church would just relinquish their rights to their own will. All of the injustice that you perceive in, in the community, in the culture, in the government, in your home, and your place of work could be solved in a year if we as followers of Jesus would say, Lord, not my will, but yours. It has the power to change. So how do we do this? How do we shift our hearts into a posture of relinquishment? Well, I wanna tell you about a guy named Brother Lawrence, and this guy is fascinating uh, if you haven't heard about him. He is the author of a book called Practicing the Presence of God, which is maybe one of the best books that I've ever read on the spiritual discipline of abiding in prayer. Um, Brother Lawrence was a 17th century monk. Uh, he worked uh, in, in France uh, at a monastery as a chef. Uh, he was plagued by chronic spinal uh, illness his entire life uh, that put him in excruciating pain. Uh, he was one of the most unassuming people that you'd probably ever meet, no formal education, no theological degree. And yet what was remarkable about this man was that he Despite his lowly circumstances, uh, he developed the practice of living in constant uh, communion with God through prayer, like continual conversation with him. And, and, and he simplifies prayer in this way. Uh, listen to his words. He says, the most holy and necessary practice in our spiritual life is the presence of God. That means finding constant pleasure in his divine company, speaking humbly and lovingly with him in all seasons at every moment without limiting the conversation in any way. And he goes on to say, there's no greater lifestyle and no greater happiness than that of having a continual conversation with God. What's Brother Lawrence teaching us here? What he's teaching us is the power is not in your words. The power is not in your eloquence. The power is in the presence of God. That is where we see the, the power uh, of answered prayers. It's in God's presence. And so with the rest of our time, uh, I just want to share with you uh, a couple ways that you can access uh, the power of God's presence in your life. And this isn't going to be comprehensive, but I think these are two kind of more practical things that you can take away with you. Um, and the first is this, is God's will. So if we go back to the verse, uh, John 15, 7, uh, just look again what Jesus said. He said, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. If you remain in me. Put another way, just like Brother Lawrence taught us, if you stay connected to me, constant awareness to my spirit and my presence, my thoughts as your thoughts, your will and my will aligned, 
I'm talking to you guys, but I'm also, I'm also with him, right? Like having the presence of God living inside of you, then comes the power. Then comes the ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. But so often uh, as Christians, we miss this. We miss this part uh, of prayer. Uh, something fascinating that I found this week. Uh, we've talked in this series about fine wine, preaching through John 15, a, a lot about the Greek word minnow. Uh, it means to remain or to abide. One of the definitions that I found this week was uh, minnow uh, translated uh, means uh, a lodging, a lodging or a dwelling. And uh, it's almost like God's like stopping through Denver and, and he gives you a call and he's like, hey man, passing through. Plans canceled at the Holiday Inn Express. They fell through. Do you have a place for me to stay? Can I, can I set up shop at your house? Non-smoking room, king size bed, because I am a king after all was wondering, you know, if I could shack up with you, and, and, and how would you respond to that? Is it like, ah, oh, Lord, I've been expecting you? Or, or, or is it, honey, clean the house. God's coming now. Company's coming, right? What kind of environment are you creating in your life? The Holy Spirit loves to dwell in places where he is welcome. Are you living your life in a manner that is inviting to the presence of God or pushing him away? It's a question worth considering. Uh, the starting point of praying powerful prayers in the presence of God is not saying the right words, is being the right person. You, you will not rise to the level of your eloquence, you will fall to the level of your character. And this is kind of counterintuitive because oftentimes in prayer we think, all right, I gotta get it right, like I gotta say the right things and that's where the power is at. And what Jesus is simply saying is, is no, 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 I, I need you to be the right person. I need you to be holy as I am holy. Uh, it was Luther, Martin Luther, who famously said, he said, Christianity is uh, one beggar helping another beggar find food. And so I just want you to think about what, what we're about to go through is this is me helping you find some food, one beggar to another. Uh, my besetting sin for uh, as long as I can remember <laughs> has been uh, excessive media consumption, Netflix and social media. Like this has been, I, I, I've experienced the consequences of, of, this, of this in my life in many ways. Um, and, and what's funny about it too is it's like at this point, I, I realize like the technology is designed to addict us. There's been so many documentaries and, and articles that have come out about like, hey, this stuff is highly addictive and yet I still find myself falling into the trap sometimes. And for as long as I can remember, uh, I've watched all nine seasons of The Office every year, like chronologically, okay? I love The Office. It's amazing. 201 episodes. You know what that means? That's 100 hours of watching television, watching fictional characters be idiots in a fictional workspace. And look, I'm not here to bag on The Office. I love Michael Scott, right? Dear place in my heart. I wish The Office was real sometimes, okay? Uh, but what, what I'm saying is, is that spending 100 hours watching television, saturating my mind in, in, in things that are not of God, it's not like that's a sin. I'm not here to tell you that's a sin. I just think that God has better. I just think that God has better for us. What, what would 100 hours of diligently pursuing God in prayer do to your life? What would 100 hours of, of, of intentional one-on-one -on -one conversations with your spouse do for your marriage? What would 100 hours of intentionally parenting uh, your, your kids in the ways of Jesus uh, do for, for their lives later on down the road? I think at some, some point as followers of Jesus, we have to... We have to give up playing this wretched game of minimum integrity, going from sin to lesser sin. Your inheritance in Christ Jesus is to go from glory to glory, daily being conformed into his image. We are called to be people who are marked by a holiness that hurts the eyes. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Timothy 2. He says this. He says, now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood in clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. What he's saying is there's two types of vessels. There, there's silver chalices, gold cups, that are set apart as holy for use in the kingdom of God, and there are vessels for dishonorable use. Do you know what I call those? garbage bins and ashtrays. And what, what God is telling us, and this is challenging, but receive the word. What, what God is telling us is uh, you can't have the expectations of a life, of a golden chalice life with a, a garbage bin lifestyle. What is the thing that's holding you back? And I think it, 
it beckons the question, like, what's your shadow side? Because all of us have a shadow side. Is there anything in your life that's dishonoring God that if you don't change it, or perhaps the people uh, close to you found out about it, would destroy you? What is that thing for you? What a wonderful opportunity to bring it into the light through the, through the, the conscious act of repentance, of confessing to trusted people and to confessing uh, to God. We live in, in, in cancel culture. All of us are so consciously aware of this, right? We see people getting canceled all the time. And if you guys are like me, I'm sure at some point in your lives, you probably feared that. Like that thing that I did so many years ago, it's gonna come back and haunt me in some way. Uh, please let this free you up. Uh, listen to me when I say this. Your sin will not destroy you. God has a wonderful solution to your sin. It's called the cross. Your covering up of your sin is what will destroy you. What an incredible opportunity uh, to confess openly uh, before God. Um, God will not be mocked. <laughs> God is holy. God is not invested in maintaining uh, our moral status and character before other people in the public. God is invested in his glory in our sanctification. Let us be holy as he is holy. The second way to access the power of God's presence in your life is through God's word. Uh, let's go back to the verse, uh, Jesus' words. He says this. He says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Uh, the Western theology of prayer is what are we praying for? The biblical theology of prayer is who are we praying to? There's a shift there. There's something that's different. Uh, but I think the tension that so many of us sit in is, is that when it comes to prayer, we often use our own words. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like anytime you are praying, like that is, that is wonderful. That, but, but God wants to take you to, to, to the next step. He wants to take you to the next stage. I think about worship. W when we finish up this message, we're gonna go into a time of worship and, and there's gonna be a worship leader. Kyle's gonna come up here uh, along with, with, with his team. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna lead us through songs. And all worship is is prayer with a melody, right? It's, it's just two sides of the same coin. And these are people that, are, that have thought about uh, worship before, right? Like they're, they're, they're singing words that are ordained to God. But yet when it comes to prayer, we dip into our own wells and we pray our own words. When in the Bible, there is a tremendous resource of guided prayers in the scriptures. Uh, learning to pray from the apostle Paul. Lear learning to pray how Jesus prayed. Learning to pray how the prophets prayed in, in the Old Testament. Uh, this will transform your life. Uh, there is a book uh, that I just wanna, I wanna share with you guys as a resource uh, that has been transformational in my prayer life. It's called Face to Face. Um, you guys have may have, maybe have seen this before. And this is not a, a how-to book on prayer. This isn't like, okay, here's like all the steps. This is what you do. This is what you, no, no. All this is, is it's a daily devotional. And every day there are like five prayer prompts, like adoration, confession, thanksgiving, uh, repentance. And each one is just a scriptural guide. And so what somebody did was they took the time to go through and find every single scripture uh, in that area of confession and put them together in the form of a devotional. And I use this almost every single day. And as I pray God's word back to him, it just changes my heart. And look, if you don't have this book, that's okay. L let me just give you a gift. The book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is an incredible resource for all of us. Uh, David was an incredible prayer word. The, the ancient Hebrew culture, they called the book of Psalms the book of prayer. But we don't think of it that way in our culture today. Uh, let me just give you a challenge. There are 150 Psalms. Pull out the book of Psalms and just pray one Psalm per day. No performance, no, no change in the words to, to, to make it sound like you want it to sound. Just pray God's word back to him and I promise you, it will change your heart you will notice your desire starting to change. You'll notice God's thoughts in, in your thoughts, in his heart, in your heart, in your will aligned to him. I'll, uh, I'll close with this. Um, there's, a, there's an album on my phone uh, titled God's Faithfulness. And uh, this is a, an album that has been very special to me and something that I, I really treasure. And the reason why is because it's full of pictures uh, that point me back to, to moments in my past where God moved massively. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm just so quick to forget God's faithfulness. Like I'm so quick to forget the times like where he moved mountains uh, and answered prayers. And so I keep it on my phone to keep those things at the front of my mind so that when I am going through a difficult season or I am going through a season of suffering, like many of you may find yourselves in today and all of us as followers of Jesus inevitably will find ourselves in because Jesus said in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And so what I do is, is I'll just pull these pictures out from time to time and I'll reflect on them. And, and the picture I'm about to show you is one that I really treasure. Now you can go ahead and put that picture up. Uh, this is a, 
uh, taken in 2016, six years ago. Uh, this is me right here. And this is an oil processing plant um, up in northern Colorado. And uh, a few months before this picture was taken, this was a, a time in my life where just things were rocking. Like everything was going great. Some of you may find that yourself in that season today, which is amazing. Uh, I had just uh, bought a new house. I just gotten a promotion. Uh, I was engaged to be married uh, to somebody that I love dearly. It was just an incredible season. Like I just remember like, like reflecting on that season with so much joy. And um, things shifted quickly. Um, the, the girl that I was engaged to be married to, without going into all the details, uh, she, she one day came up to me, she took her ring off, she put it in the palm of my hand. And she said, I, I just can't marry you. We had a, a wedding plan, we had the guest list out, we had the venue picked out, I just can't marry you. And I was devastated, like devastated, like emotionally distraught. I remember sitting at the, thir- uh, the, the Chipotle at 32nd and Lowell, uh, Billy Sprague sitting across from me, like weeping uncontrollably. Because I just had this hopeful expectation for how the, the, the future was supposed to go. And it didn't pan out that way. And it was very, very difficult. And if that's any of you today, like if you're going through a season where you're suffering, if you've ever experienced the pain of losing a relationship, it could be a marriage, it could be a friendship, it could be a, a child. I just want you to know that God has so much grace for you in this moment, that he wants to use what you're going through for a significant purpose. During that season, I just remember there was nothing that comforted my soul. Like I was seeing counselors, I was talking to friends, and the only thing that brought me comfort was I would, I would wake up at four o'clock in the morning because I had to get to work super early, and I would just read the word of God, page after page after page, day after day after day, month after month, and I did this for a year. And every day, as I would read God's word, I would just write down on a yellow sticky note a a promise that that I would take from that day's reading. And I'd put it in my pocket and I would walk to this plant working outside and I would walk those rows. And as my soul felt burdened and weary, I would just pull that yellow sticky note out of my pocket and I'd read it. And I would just pray and I would commune with God and say, God, this is so hard. This is so difficult, but you're here. You're with me. Your presence is here. And so Jesus, restore my soul. Let your will be done. And what's amazing is throughout that time, I kept a journal and I wrote it in almost every day. And that journal is such a gift to me today because I get the chance to go back through it and I can literally watch through the words that I wrote six years ago, my heart changing, my heart changing. And I stopped praying prayers like God restore the relationship. And I start praying prayers like, Lord, this is so difficult, but if this is not your will, let it be done. And I stopped praying prayers like, God, I'm so angry. Like, why have you forsaken me? And I start praying prayers like, Lord, I forgive that person. I forgive that person and I pray for them my heart just started changing. Uh, It's so fitting that during that season, um, about six months into it, that I receive a a random email from a couple named Jason and Molly Soderstrom, uh, seeing a a picture of two kids getting baptized on uh, the CU Boulder College campus, two people I didn't know. And I, I go to the bottom of that email and there's a little button that says, click here to give to the ministry of Jason and Molly. And I click give, didn't know them at all. And like two days later, Jason calls me and he goes, hey, who are you? I'm like, who are you? <laughs> Quick talk in Oklahoma accent. He's like, hey, let's, let's, let's meet up. So him and I meet in a Qdoba in Firestone, Colorado, six years ago. And he cast vision to me for what would someday become the brook. And I look at my life now, and my life has been transformed, completely transformed by the word of God. This is why I'm so passionate about prayer and the word. The word of God is the greatest gift that we will be given in this lifetime. It will change you. It is sharper than a double-edged sword. And it's available to all of us. The presence of God is available to all of us. It's so sweet, but so many of us miss it. God extended that invitation to me so many years ago and he extends that invitation to me daily to come into his presence. And he extends the same invitation uh, to all of you. And so we're faced with a response. We're gonna step into the presence of God. We're gonna miss it. We're now gonna move into a time of, uh, of worship and, and prayer and, and communion. And uh, the band's actually gonna come up here right now and uh, they're gonna sing us through a song as we pray. And so I just wanna invite you guys to stay seated. Now get yourselves in a comfortable position and uh, just close your eyes, close your eyes. Take a deep breath. This is a time between you and God. Don't worry about the people around you. Don't worry about what other people think. And what I'd like you all to do is just to ask this question in your heart. Lord, what do you want to speak to me right now? The 
Holy Spirit is a counselor. The Holy Spirit lives inside of you and God speaks to us. Let us enter into a posture of listening, just listening, no performance, just listening. Don't worry about how to pray. Just acknowledge God in your heart. Jesus, we just surrender this time over to you right now. Help us to hear your voice. Lord, what do you want to speak to your people? What do you want us to know, Jesus? Father, we give this time over to you. God, I ask for breakthrough where breakthrough is needed. I ask for boldness where boldness is needed. I ask for revelation where revelation is needed. Holy Spirit, come. Speak to us and show us your will. Thanks so much for joining us for RST Online. Be sure to like and subscribe and download the RST app so you can stay up to date with all things happening at Restoration Church.